This is the Physics Ed Podcast. Fiona, welcome to the Physics Ed Podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Ben. I'm excited to be here. Oh, look, I'm absolutely stoked to have you here. And um, and honestly, it's not we've communicated, but um, through Twitter. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's actually kind of yes. cool to see you face to face. Yeah, it's like you know the person really well, but you haven't actually met them. So it's great to actually meet you. <laughs> Although I must say, on those um those Twitter chats, uh, and by the way, if anyone's wondering what I really talk about, primary STEM chat ha- happens every Thursday night mm. on eight thirty Australian Eastern Standard Time. Yeah. It is an awesome place to hang out with lots of educators. Yeah. That chat was, I mean, you're you're amongst you know, many many educators. It's in a flurry. It's so quick. <laughs> It is absolutely, I had to download TweetDeck to actually keep up with it because I can't do it on my phone. So my first tip there is if anyone is keen to do a Twitter chat, get onto TweetDeck because it'll make your life so much easier. Oh, totally. So and especially if you end up posting it, it's just insane. Yes, yes, okay. absolutely. But here's the thing, I mean, it, it, as, as much as all, Twitter is awesome and whatnot, I mean, you've been involved in education for a while and clearly deal with a lot of the younger kids. Tell us what do you get up to? Yes, so I've been with the younger kids for the last five or six years in a school setting. Um, I've also got two young boys at home, so I'm really in the thick of it with the young ones. Um, I've also had experience working in childcare and and things like that. So really, I've been working with little kids for about 13 years or so. Um, It's a bit busy, but it's amazing how excited the kids get, how curious they are. Um, all of those sorts of things. So, yeah, I'm really excited to be chatting about the early years today. So, um, so when did you start doing it? Um, in terms of working with the kids? Yeah. Yeah, so I for, straight from school I did um, before and after school care and then I did a bit of childcare, like in a childcare centre with sort of zero to five years. So I started with the younger kids. Um, I worked in my church for about six years running kids programs and things like that as well Um, and then I decided I really wanted to be an educator really get into the thick of it with the kids um, in the day-to-day and really have an impact on their whole development Um, so I graduated from uh, university back in 2015 I think so I've been working since then um, with sort of year one and year two um, as well as um, having my my young boys who are two and four (laughs) <laughs> you can't get away from the young ones no matter what you do. Love it. Absolutely love it. Although there are some days when I say to my husband, hmm, will I have any children listen to me today? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> What's really cool about doing the early, early years and dealing with you know, grade one and two is that you get to see the effect of the, of the, you know, the programs you get put into preschool. And then they really are quite deep and varied, actually, in, depending on what center you work with. But seeing the impact of what you know, the, the kids come from multiple places yeah they can really have different skills depending on what they've been exposed to. Absolutely. I think um, in the younger years, there really is such a wide variety of skills um, and also, I think, mindsets as well. So um, their understanding of things, uh, their, their patience for things, their, their resilience for things as well. So really when you get a whole lot of the little kids with you in either kindergarten or year one you really have this whole spectrum that you're kind of trying to work with and you're trying to meet all the students where they're at um, which can be very challenging because you want what's best for all of them but it's like how many how much time of the day do I really have to try and really nut out the the nitty-gritty for all of them well that's the reality is like I mean catatou education especially K let's be honest I mean it is so incredibly wide I mean it's kind of like you're wrangling (laughs) <laughs> for the first couple Absolutely. of months. Absolutely. Um, I mean, some kids have been accelerated. They've been through. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed how many um, some parents put kids through like tutoring, even, and the kids like, yeah. oh. um, yes. and others are still learning. They've only just learned toilet training. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. That why? And, and I think coming as like a, a parent as well, there really is this culture of um, comparison as well. So, you know, like you're talking with other parents, you're like, oh, my, my child has started reading books and, and they're four years old or my child knows their numbers. And I think that that can be really challenging as well for educators because I'm giving a lot of feedback to parents saying it's okay that they can't read by the time they're starting kindergarten because that's kind of what they're learning in kindergarten. So you're kind of trying to, um, trying to alleviate the parents' concerns there and also realise that let's not rush the kids into reading 
you know, chapter books and things like that. I think the younger years, it's all about play. And, it, and that's a really vital part of their development and how they're going to develop skills that are going to carry through to adulthood as well. And those skills can help them with those things like reading and, and writing and, and all of that. And that's one of the things I really wanted to have a chat with you about. Play is the deal with the young it's ones. And 100% deal. this thing that's coming up, this STEM thing, this STEM concept that will not go away in any way. <laughs> uh, and it really is so important for young kids. I mean, how have you been addressing like STEM? I mean, STEM can be done in so many different ways. The older yes. years, but the younger ones, direction versus not direction. What do you do with it? How do you handle it? What, are you, what have you been doing with STEM for the kids? Well, it is challenging because I think we have a very crowded curriculum mm -hmm. and there is a big focus on literacy and numeracy in those early years. And that's important, but I think STEM really offers an opportunity to, to develop those real critical 21st century skills we keep banging on about and how important they are. Um, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, um, communication, all of those things are really crucial to STEM that carry through into those literacy and numeracy as well. So um, we've had, due to um, the current circumstances with remote learning and, and COVID, we've actually had our timetable free up a little bit more. So we've been able to have some really explicit STEM time um, that really has been a challenge to fit in otherwise. I've been trying to slot it in when, when I can or integrate it into the other units um, because I just think it's really crucial for the students to be involved in. Um, so, for example, we integrated it with our literacy unit this term. We were doing a unit on monsters and we were looking at the Gruffalo, a beautiful book. I absolutely love it. Um, so we in kind of integrated it with a bit of literacy and we included maps from mathematics and we included the technology with the blue bots and the students were able to make their own little maps um, of the Gruffalo story and move the blue bots through the map and my my colleague said I've never seen a kid so engaged before and it's you're just you're covering all of those key learning areas you're covering all of those skills and it's kind of you see that and you think why wouldn't you be doing it like more often you know like I think it's once you actually get into it and you see what kind of learning the kids are doing I think that's a real buy-in for other educators as well yeah you've just you've just created a classic book haven't you like I mean yeah. you, you might be learning robotics but now now you're learning you're just teaching a story mm. you're telling a story and the kids just go nuts and suddenly yeah. Yeah, they think they're just playing with robots, but really we know that there's a lot more depth to it as well. No, you just did spatial reasoning, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Covered all the bases. <laughs> That's cool. I mean, so those people who haven't uh, seen before, blue bots are quite neat. I mean, they're the, yeah. the evolution of the bee bot. Uh, yes. Clear case, blue lights. Kind yes. of cutesy sort of. Do you get the kids to program off, the, off an iPad or do you get them to do it on the buttons? We've been doing it on the buttons with the actual robots, I think. Mm -hmm that gives them the opportunity to pick it up and explore it and yeah. sort of when they get it wrong and they're trying to debug what they've done, they kind of pick it up and go, okay, well, I've got to move it here and I've got to move it there. And I think, again, it goes to that spatial reasoning of because they're so little and they're not familiar with coding as much as maybe the, the older years, um, it really gives them that ability to kind of move it around and realise, oh, it goes here and it goes here and I've got to move along here so i the the evolution to the the ipad and that kind of coding will come but i think as an introductory just that hands-on with the actual blue bots really being helpful no i agree i mean the whole concrete learning thing comes up i mean um i honestly find it easier to teach yes just by picking the thing up and moving around and watching yeah. the kids trying to get their head around cumulative impact of their coding you know, they yes. think they press a button and that's the next thing it's going to do and they've got yeah. the other 30 commands they've given it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they forget to cancel the previous mm. program and so you just see them press the buttons and they go off and they're wondering why it's done that. You're like, oh, remember you've got to cancel the program first before you... But they pick it up really quickly, which is amazing. What's cool about this is that you could actually uh, bring in the built environment because they could build the forest for the gruffalo. They could build Absolutely. castles and bridges and whatever else you feel like. It really, and that comes down to the time thing. Yeah. Absolutely. So how yeah. would you handle this from a remote learning point of view? Because the kids are in different small houses. Yes. So we were trying to incorporate some STEM into our remote learning. So we did think like even things like baking. During uh, Anzac Day, we got the kids to, to bake the Anzac cookies. And we could do that at school. And we could also get them to do it at home. And you're, you're including, you know, your mathematics and 
you know, the science of like why is the um, bicarb soda bubbling up and things like that. We were able to incorporate those kinds of things. And it's really just trying to think of what, are the, what do the students have access to at their place? STEM's fantastic because, you know, you can kind of use almost anything to do building. Like a lot of the students in our area, they have access to Lego. So if we say, can you build, you know, X, Y, and Z, they can, they can do that. We, um, we also did, um, just trying to remember off the top of my head, there was something else I was going to say. Um, what did we get them to make? Oh, we, um, because they've got access to devices and technology, we were able to put them onto the, the Hour of Code website. Okay. So the students went through a very basic block coding with that as well. Um, but we, yeah, with our science unit last term, we included some design thinking for the year ones and they had to come up with, um, you know, they had to create something to monitor the noise levels in the classroom. And we started that before remote learning. And so, you know, we'd gone through the empathy stage and the iteration stage and the design stage and they got to that and that's where they went home. Yep. And we actually found that the students had more access to resources at home. They thought, I want to make this. Okay, I'm going to use this. I'm going to use that rather than relying on only what we had at school. So the things that the students came up with were phenomenal. They came up with lots of different um, gadgets. We had one student who made um, a, like a speaker for the phone out of plastic cups and a toilet roll. And okay. it was amazing. I loved it. And I think um, just them having a bit more space to do that at home, like because they don't, they don't have this as much of a structured timetable at home. If we say, can you turn this design that you've made into something at home? And they just ran with it. And the parents said that they loved it because they got to go and build and create and do those things. And it's not something that the parents have to monitor as much as, okay, go onto the device to do your English and your maths because that was a challenge for our kids during That's remote really learning. Cool. You know, it reminds, reminds me of a thing. I haven't actually built it, so I'm not going to describe it very well. But someone had set up a way of doing a home, home theater with some cardboard in their iPhone. Yeah, wow really really cool and something to throw the kids but I was also just thinking there too about the um, the sound meter within yeah. your room it's something I kind of did with uh, we made it but I didn't tell them what I was really doing was create we're creating devices but if it actually starts moving it's telling you that the class is too loud <laughs> <laughs> they all made their own quietening device it was awesome <laughs> oh. well that's kind of where we were going with our year ones because we were looking at sound energy and they, did, they didn't understand the concept that we wanted something that could tell the, the kids when to make noise and when to stop making noise so they were all thinking okay it's something that stops making noise so they would like ring a bell and go okay everyone be quiet and I'd be like well how how do we what can we do to make it noisy again if we want people to talk to each other and they're all like hmm and they had to really think about it so it was good to be able to include that questioning to extend their thinking as well. Oh, totally. It actually reminds me, we've run, run a lot of Lego Monsters programs and um, whenever they use the, uh, use the clap to stop, yes. um, very simple uh, yep. program. The problem is they don't allow for the actual just general noise in the classroom and they think that the thing won't move. I'm going, of course, it's already too loud. And then they having to realise they've got to change the sampling <laughs> level. <Yes. laughs> it's kind of, it's funny to watch them actually sort of realise that. Yes. Um, and then they realise that the louder they are, the more it moves, they then change it. And yep. then suddenly the, the class just becomes way louder. Because they're all screaming at the robot. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, it's good fun. The thing is, though, like, I mean, STEM is often, I mean, it depends on which way we cut it. Way. Yeah. That's a lot of the T, the technology side of it. But there's lots of science that kids can do. There's a lot of measurement and engineering and yes. whatnot. And the kids can have fun. I love the fact you were talking about the Anzac biscuit. You know, yes. By the way, if you're listening, if you haven't had an Anzac biscuit, uh, yeah, just get some golden syrup, some rolled rice, all that sort of yeah. rolled rice, rolled oats, oats early in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Rice. Maybe you could try it with rice. Ooh. That's the experiment. Ooh. Oats versus rice. But they were used in World War One, and yeah. they were fantastically awesome for our soldiers. And we've had them ever since down this way. Um, yeah. Very good. And I suppose do you have any kids um, try more than one recipe? Um, we had some students. So we had a recipe at school to do it with the, the handful of students who were still at school at the time. But we had students who, you know, their parents had recipes that they'd been using and. Um, yeah, we had a few different bits and pieces. And we also try to include, again, we included literacy into it. We put like, um, uh, we're doing procedure writing. So we also included a scaffold 
scaffold or procedure writing where the, the students have to cut and paste and put in like the recipe as well. So I think that had a lot of the steps on it. But because the students were at home, they did have that flexibility where they used a recipe that their parents had or they changed the ingredients a little bit. And, you know, that's okay. <laughs> we're okay with that. Uh, yeah. No, it is actually it is a good thing too because like, uh, getting kids to understand their testing way yeah. from a very, very early age. And procedural thinking is a thing. It turns out yeah. you actually got to do it right through your whole life. Um, <laughs> getting kids to actually do that and have – Oh, it'd be interesting to actually get the kids. I wonder. I'm just sort of making this up. I'm just, I wonder if you could get them to write a recipe that gets sent to another kid to build, and they have, they could compare. I wonder if they could compare the two. So if you, I've done something similar. We've done something similar with Lego building, or no, sorry, with pattern blocks. We got the the students to create something with the pattern blocks, and they had to write down the steps and then share it with a partner to recreate. And it's really interesting because. With you one, um, sometimes the steps are not as explicit as they could be. And I don't know if you've seen those um, videos on, on YouTube with the dad who tries to make the peanut butter sandwich. Oh, the sandwich is a classic. With, the, with, his, with his kids. So yeah. we actually showed the kids that. Yeah. And we, we made fairy bread with them. And I was the, the person who was pretending I was following their exact instructions. So I was wearing bread on my head and I was sticking a knife in the butter and trying to like move it around. And the kids are all laughing going, what? And we're like, the instructions weren't specific enough. Right. So it's really interesting that real like visual um, example for the students really makes a big difference. So sometimes you've got to be really explicit with the younger students um, so that they kind of, it tweaks that understanding of, oh, actually, I need to be a bit more, you know, elaborate with what I'm explaining and my details have to be really specific. Um, but, yeah, and it's also a lot of fun. <laughs> it is a lot of fun. And um, sometimes some schools will have, they'll link their young ones with the older kids as a leadership thing. Is that something that you do at your school? Yeah, we do have a buddy program. Obviously, due to the current restrictions, <laughs> we haven't been able to do it because... Um, that's obviously too many students in one space. But yeah, we once a fortnight, our year ones would have a year six buddy and we would do different bits and pieces. We've done, you know, some pen pal writing and things. Um, our plan for when we came back was to do a bit of Minecraft because the year sixes were very jealous that I was doing Minecraft with the year ones. So we had to say, okay, when, when we come back, we can do a bit of Minecraft and building within that. So um, yeah. yeah, there's obviously lots of, opportunities for STEM there as well and for the older kids to scaffold the younger kids for some of those more challenging um yeah activities well totally so I mean I actually think of my daughter uh, she's in year five she was completely jealous knowing <laughs> yeah don't it. tell her <laughs> <laughs> the thing is there are a lot of games out there that work incredibly well for teaching kids yeah I've, I mean I've actually I'm aware of chemistry teachers using my yeah um you know they can totally go right into it yeah, and I think um, I, I love Minecraft. I've been using it for the last five or six years. Um, and I think a lot of teachers sort of shy away because they're like, I don't understand Minecraft. Oh. And I think part of it is just letting go of that and realising the kids will probably know more than you do, and that's okay. Um, if you know the basics of setting up, you know, the environment so that it's, you know, there's no nasty things coming at you and um, once you can kind of do that and set those parameters which is really simple to do the kids have lots of exploration with that so we did a geography unit this term um, about Australian environments and some of the kids chose to make their environment in Minecraft to demonstrate what they learned about the animals and the plants and um, how people can care for those environments um, and I think because the kids are used to using it at home as well they, they come with a lot of pre-knowledge and expertise. So a lot of the times I say to some of my students, okay, you're my expert. If someone asks me a question, can you go and help them out? And that way I've got a few people who can help in that area. Actually, I'm going to ask, because maybe some people will be listening, you know, like, I don't know, I can't visualise how you teach the environment and animals in Minecraft. So what sort of things do the kids create? So... The first thing that we do is we set up the world so it's completely flat. So it's like a, just an endless green field. So it's yep. just completely blank canvas for the kids. They, we did desert and coral reef environments. They were the two that the students got to choose from. And so 
because they had this completely blank canvas, which can be overwhelming at times, um, and some students sort of struggled, I think, with the open-endedness of it. Um, but a lot of the students, you know, they just, they choose a sand block and they start building it around to make a bit of a desert space. And we talked about what kind of plants are there in the desert? Oh, there's some spin effects. Oh, there's a little grass thing that looks like spin effects. I'll plant it in here. And then we talked about how there's dingoes in the desert, but there aren't dingoes in Minecraft. So the kids go, well, I'll put a wolf in because a wolf is kind of like a dingo. I'm like, okay, that's really good logic there. Like, you know, good reasoning skills. So they put those in. Um, so it's just they're, they're bringing their understanding of the desert into, into Minecraft and think they're using those kind of logical skills of, okay, what can I use? I don't have a dingo. I don't have a kangaroo. How can I create something that represents that? Or um, with the education edition of Minecraft, you can um, build signs. So the kids were able to actually type in some of the information that was a bit harder to represent in Minecraft. Interpretive signs. That, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yes. You can almost create like a tourist trail. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I did that at the start of the term. I made our own school rainforest because we started with a rainforest scaffold. So I showed them like how the world could look. And we, we went through the process of inquiry through that first before they went on their own. Um, but there's so many options for it. I, I just love Minecraft. So I could talk about it all day. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. And actually, one of the things that you mentioned there was the open-ended problem. Like you've got this big flat green 2D yeah. space. In some ways for students, it's, that's kind of like, really challenging area. Even yes. if it was Minecraft, it was just anything. It's like, hey, go for it. I don't want to give you any yes. scaffolds. I don't give you any instructions. Yes. You sort it out. And yes. um, quite often, with kids can be almost scaffold to the, the, the nth you know, yes. degree. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think that was one of the things that, you know, we're always reflecting as teachers ourselves. I think next time, I probably wouldn't have made it so open-ended for some of the students because some of the students sort of struggled with it. Um, but the other amazing thing about Minecraft is, all the kids work together. They sit next to each other and go, oh, are you building this? Oh, you could just do this here. Oh, I made a dingo. with." And there's that collaboration there. So the students who are really struggling with those kinds of things were able to turn to their peers and get support. I, I didn't have any students who were struggling to come up with something because they were all sitting next to a friend or two or I had huddles of tables of about eight kids who were just working on it and talking about it and doing this and doing that. And, and it's just amazing to see such collaboration at such a young age as well, um, just working together on that problem. What's well, the thing? Like, um, often we go, oh, they're only six. Mm. So, but they've still got a human intellect in there. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. This. And I, I've been astounded by some of the, um, the STEM things we've done at school. We, at, earlier in the year, to try and get to know the, the kids, we did um, a STEM challenge of working with partners. Choose someone who you wouldn't normally work with um, try and design something for the classroom to make the classroom a better place. And it was great to see what the kids really value in a classroom, in a classroom setting. And two of my students who sort of are a bit lower on the, um, the literacy side of things came up with the most phenomenal building of our bag room and they created this water station because we all have water and we need... And just... You know, the students that you don't think, you're not sure how they're going to go are the ones who usually really surprise you when it comes to that hands-on building, collaboration kind of exercise. Um, yeah, I think they're, they're a lot more capable than we give them credit for. And I think that's why we really need to be more um, open to play um, in, in the early years because when we allow them to play, we can really see their curiosity and their thinking coming through. Um, yeah. Great advice. Actually, I was going to ask you for advice. In fact, so framing this actually. So if, <laughs> if you had, uh, I don't know, let's, ooh, it's hard to say to early educators, uh, primary educators, actually just say educators. Yes. <laughs> There's an sure. idea. Sure. There's an idea. So you had a bunch of uh, educators are about to enter the wide world of education. Um, what would be your advice saying, look, righto, so you're going to produce a some sort of STEM unit. And I know you're going to be teaching in grade five. I know some of you going to be teaching in grade one. And hey, I've got yes. a few people who are going to go into grade 10. Yes. What's some generic advice yep. for anyone listening? Trying to think about yep. how do I sort of kick off my STEM units, make something interesting, fun, irrespective of the age. Because that's what I think yes. that what you're getting at really just parkins every age. Yeah. Well, the first thing I would have to say up front is I really think that you need to connect with other like-minded educators because there is nothing more valuable than the 
advice and the ideas that you can bounce off from other educators. So joining Twitter this year has been by far the best PD I have ever done. Um, and joining this primary STEM chat we were talking about earlier has been, for me, just so eye-opening. And every week I get new ideas of things to try in my classroom. Um, I've got connections of people I can talk to if I've got questions or, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do here. Can anyone help me out? And I always get a bunch of advice and ideas. So I think by far that's my first piece of advice. Um, I think the second thing is to really look at at the curriculum and at your program and your outcomes and what is it that you're actually wanting to achieve because sometimes and I'm, I'm guilty of this as well because you know I love Minecraft and I think oh, I'm just going to do some Minecraft but I think we need to take a step back and think about what is it that we're actually wanting the students to achieve um, to be able to do and and then kind of frame the lesson around that so for example with the geography unit that we did it, we we planned out the geography unit first and then we kind of expanded it to okay so how can the students demonstrate what they're learning and how can they work on an open-ended problem and that's where the minecraft came in so i think if you look at the the programs that you've got and the outcomes you've got and then there is a lot of understanding the resources and tools that you've got so it's really hard to just throw Minecraft into it if you don't really understand it that much. So you're going away and just learning a bit about those tools, I've found really helpful. So I spent a lot of time during the week going off and researching some technology tools or going to find some STEM activities or books that can be helpful. Um, yeah, I think those sorts of things are, are really good. Um, yes, I can't rave highly enough about Minecraft. So that, that would be a good resource because I think that Minecraft can fit into a lot of lesson ideas. Um, so definitely check that out as a resource to go to. Um, and even just collecting lots of resources for building activities as well. So I've got a storeroom full of recycled materials from home that I've been collecting over the years. Um, just so if you want to put in a building challenge from a picture book you're reading in literacy, um, you've got those resources ready to go as well. Yeah, I think uh, we all become bow birds, don't we? All kind of <laughs> Absolutely. I'm usually, I'm usually sending messages to friends and family going, can you save these bottle lids for me? Can you get this for me? I'm, I'm usually scoured, scouring around wherever I can. Oh, it's crazy. I have a room overfilling. With, I just do. <laughs> now in our workplace, just outside of this room, just fill stuff. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, so ne it's so necessary for those things. So it is, and yeah. actually, especially when we got like, my poor co-workers, like, the, are you sure we're keeping this? I can't tell <laughs> if it's trash or treasure anymore. I've got no idea. Okay, it's all mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need it because you know, as soon as you throw it out, that's when you'll need it. <laughs> oh, I'm still looking for a particular old camera I was going to use for forensics. Prop. Oh, but anyway, no. that's a, that's a different <laughs> that's story. That's a different story. And, <laughs> and when you talk about the uh, the PLN thing, totally, I, I actually reckon that that probably is probably the number one yeah, for me. Absolutely. Because I mean, obviously, we can teach the biology, whatever it is that you're teaching. Yeah. Um, but hanging out with people who have done it before, or have at least done it in a different way is useful. And actually, it's a half the problem too, because once you go down into PLN, it then becomes a rabbit hole of ideas. Absolutely. Like, Sometimes oh, you get too many ideas, and then you want to do all of them, but you're like, okay. I've got to do one at a time. So, yeah, sometimes you, you get a bit overwhelmed with them, but it's fantastic, yeah. Absolutely. Hey, look, there'll be some people that would love to get in touch with you, uh, if, you know, if they may. How, how would they be able to do that? Um, the best way would be through Twitter because I'm, I'm on there quite frequently. Um, so my username is Fee, F-I, Morrison, M-O-R-R-I-S-O-N, 2. So that's the best way to get in touch with me. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about anything with early year STEM, with Minecraft, yep. Yeah. I would love to have a chat. Absolutely. And as usual, we'll put that in the show notes and yeah. be able to check that out. Look, thank you very much for hanging out. So it's on the school holidays. I know you've got a little bit of time left, but I mean, hopefully um, get some still actual holiday time in amongst your lesson. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Good fun. And we'll catch you, uh, no doubt. On, yeah. <laughs> this is like an ad for yeah, hashtag so primary stem chat, but it is. It is. Join us on Thursday. <laughs> it is. It's been really helpful for me as an educator yeah. from a practice point of view. Yeah, and just absolutely. obviously is to hang out with people trying to do the same. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. We'll see you on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Catch you on Thursday. Look, thanks very much. Have a great morning. You too. Thank you. You've been listening to another Physics Ed podcast. We're excited about science. Subscribe to us on iTunes to download the next episode as soon as it's released. And don't forget, for hundreds of ideas, free experiments, our new Be Amazing book and more, 
go to physicseducation.com.au. That's physics spelled F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S. -Z